yeah, I have a no problem. Well, thank you again, uh, Kiara, for the kind invitation and uh, you know the uh, and you know tell the right is something I've uh, always looked forward to. But unfortunately, you know this uh, so for because of COVID, we went, I wasn't able to attend in person. But anyway, it's it's still nice to be participate uh in in a. In a, in a greater fashion uh, this year, especially. And uh, I'd like to thank Kiara for this opportunity to help, uh, you know, generate some data sets and just generally, uh, you know, listening, organizing and listening to all the nice talks so far. Uh, so uh, not to worry, my son sometimes have a young uh, eight month old, so he keeps me awake sometimes at night. So it's uh, not too bad. I, I'm got used to it for the past few months. <laughs> Uh, I do the midnight shift sometimes. Uh, anyway, I've uh, uh, delighted to share with you my uh, works uh, on uh, neuromorphic tactile uh, systems, right? And I'm currently an uh, assistant professor in the National University of Singapore. Uh, I run the sensors.ai labs uh, where I look at uh, material science to develop tactile sensing materials, uh, making devices more sustainable by making them uh, self healing, right? Uh, a bit inspired by skin actually and and really a, a big part is really these neuro inspired devices uh, as well uh, and of course uh, if you are talking about electronic skins uh, you have to make them stretchable uh, so we also try to make uh, electronics soft and stretchable uh, using different uh, technologies but today i wouldn't have a lot of time so i'll go through a bit of the tactile sensing materials we've developed and the neuromorphic uh, systems that we have uh, looked at uh, you may have seen this uh, video uh, before, but you know basically this person is completely blindfolded, and he's doing you know a fairly complex task of uh, slicing vegetables without chopping his fingers off, and uh, you can see that he's doing this completely blindfolded, right? And so just using touch, he's able to navigate his space, find the other half of the onion, and continue slicing. Uh, and I strongly advise you not to try this at home because uh, you will need some training. And uh, the trick, in fact, is actually uh, using your index finger, the back of your index finger, uh, as the way to gauge where the, the knife uh, is slicing. Right? But I strongly advise you not to try this. Uh, if you do, <laughs> do not do it at your own risk. And unfortunately, I shall not uh, be liable for any loss of blood. So in any case, I think tactile intelligence is something really unique to many species, uh, especially humans. Uh, and the skin covers our entire body. It's the largest sense organ. Uh, and I think in a lot of aspects, touch drives, is, it drives human intelligence and is a big part of the you know, ability to fuse different data streams together to make sense of the environment. Uh, and touch is really, you know, the the ability to sense and also perceive. And when we talk about perception, as some of the talks have uh, discussed, is about understanding and learning, right? And this is quite interesting aspect. I think that you'll see a lot more uh, interesting algorithms, neuromorphic ones uh, coming online you know, through the efforts of many researchers uh, attending Telluride. So uh, the skin you know, is, uh, is quite an amazing organ. It has many different cells uh, and each cells actually have different uh, sensing abilities. It can sense the different mechanical vibration frequencies and so on, right? Uh, at the same time, it can also sense um, temperature and humidity and so on. So it gives you quite a good picture of the environment you are in. And this really is a systems uh, is a systems architecture that allows this, right? You have, you know, materials that are sensitive to the environment, and then you have the system, the nervous system that communicates the information to your central nervous system for processing. Uh, there are also some processing um, before it reaches the brain, uh, and I think this aspect is still um, being studied. Uh, it's not so clear what kind of processing really takes place uh, after meeting some of the you know, neuroscientists in this area, like Johansson, who's one of the pioneers in somatosensory science. Um, but regardless, I think that the combination of materials, uh, making them sensitive, as well as the ability to transmit the information uh, in a very asynchronous and parallel fashion uh, that 
mimics the nervous system uh, would be critical if you want to really scale skins for robots. And there's been a lot of nice work which I will share in the past, uh, uh, especially, you know, uh, Kara is one of the pioneers as well uh, as uh, Gordon Cheng and many others. I think it's quite an exciting area. And I joined uh, this field uh, in about 20, uh, 2008 when I did my PhD at uh, Stanford. And back then we were very interested in using soft materials uh, for semiconducting properties and also sensing properties. And um, one of the driving motivation is actually to give robots the sense of touch so that they can understand the environment. Uh, and we're not talking about humanoid robots. We only talk about simple robots that actually tries to climb on walls. Uh, so this was a Bukowski um, in Stanford, uh, you know, had a nice conversation with my then uh, 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 supervisor, Zanambao, you know, about uh, having tactile sensors for climbing robots. And, uh, you know, and if you look at many of the traditional materials used for electronic uh, purposes, like silicon and many of the metals that they use right now, uh, they tend to be a very high modulus. And if you want to mimic skin, which is about megapascals or less, uh, in terms of the Young's modulus, there's a big gap. And I think that the uh, ability to program soft and organic materials uh, presents many opportunities right, for us to mimic aspects of human skin uh, beyond just sensing, for example, self-healing. And uh, throughout the years, there's a lot of uh, progress using materials, uh, new materials and chemistry uh, to develop semiconducting uh, materials as well to allow electronic functions on all these, uh, on all these pictures I've shown here uh, for use on sort of more plastic or more bendable uh, form factors. And, uh, you know, before I graduate, you know, I started looking at the mechanoreceptors and how they transmit information. And so we, we kind of uh, uh, published the work thinking about uh, early uh, device prototypes that could be used to transmit information in the form of uh, rate coding or frequency-based encoding. And uh, we kind of uh, developed the system into an optogenetics platform where the idea is to send information using light pulses to neuron cells modified by uh, optogenetics. Uh, basically, the, uh, these neurons start to respond to light. And so we can actually stimulate the neurons if we send the you know, uh, pulses at different frequencies and the neurons get stimulated. So this was sort of an early thinking behind mimicking mechanoreceptors. Uh, and at the same time, we also looked at materials and how to make them sensitive. So in, in terms of making materials sensitive, I think there's a lot of different strategies. And one of the strategies we looked at uh, was really about microstructuring or designing materials to have certain uh, three-dimensional structures. Uh, and one of them, which is very quite popular uh, and have been uh, replicated uh, across many different research groups uh, ever since we published uh, the work uh, in, in nature materials uh, using micro pyramids. And this micro pyramid structure actually concentrates uh, stress at the tip of the pyramid, uh, which then causes a larger strain in the vertical direction. And so this basically makes it behave about 10 times softer than the actual uh, original material properties of the rubber or silicone that we use. Uh, so, so for example, if the silicone was about one megapascal in modulus, Young's modulus, the actual structure, you know, is about about 0.1 uh, megapascals, so 10 times um, more sensitive to touch and compressive forces. So then, this has been uh, used quite a lot, and right now in my group, we're looking at developing models uh, that we can use to simulate this behavior and actually measure. The electronic properties, one of which is capacitance. And I think many of you are very familiar with capacitive sensors. Uh, and today, actually, a lot of the touchscreen devices that you use relies on capacitive sensing, right? Uh, and so, so this becomes a, of interest if we can model the capacitance output of such structures. Uh, and in this, in this case, our lab, we, we are studying these structures at a micro scale. So we have a special indenter that basically uh, indents on each microstructure and we can kind of model the behavior and we can get uh, analytical solutions that matches 
the empirical data that we, re, that we observe in the lab in our measurements. And so then we can start to build different um, models and actually programs, right? Almost like a search engine that you can use to find capacitive sensors uh, for your particular use case or your particular circuit. Uh, if any of you have any interest uh, in, in developing capacitive circuits using this model, please let me know. Uh, I'll be happy to share some of the uh, MATLAB code uh, for simulated outputs of these capacitance, uh, uh, capacitance values of these structures. Uh, another thing that we've started to tackle uh, is this viscoelastic property of materials. Uh, when you use soft materials, they're very sensitive, but you can see that they have this slow return to original uh, shape. And this is what we call viscoelasticity. And basically what happens is this then affects your subsequent measurements in, in pressure. So the skin can mitigate such effects. Actually, the skin is highly uh, viscoelastic and it mitigates this effect because there's a lot of sensors, uh, a very high density, right? Uh, and this, this population response tries to, is mitigated, uh, uh, basically mitigates the ability to sense over many uh, occurrences of the stimuli. Uh, and, and so in a, in a, also in a, the other thing is in the real world, usually the stimuli don't occur at the same spot, right? So, but for robotic applications, very often you, you find that uh, this stimuli happens to be more or less the same region. And so you really want something that can respond quite fast. And so we developed a, a, a technique um, published uh, also not too long ago last year uh, where we looked at reducing this hysteresis for uh, pyramidal structures uh, with a hybrid approach using metal films deposited on these structures. And we can show that we actually get, you know, uh, we've, when we use such sensors, we actually get much better classification accuracies. And I'll show you uh, uh, what kind of task we, we are using, right? So in this case, we are, we are using the task of classifying textures. And so the red line shows the accuracy of our low hysteresis sensor and the blue line shows a more hysteretic behavior uh, in more traditional materials that are completely soft right so we can see that the classification accuracy is higher and also the deviation uh, is also lower right uh, after seconds after contact so the task that we use uh, is you know, it's actually texture and we use a high, a relatively high density array, still an order of magnitude, magnitude less than fingertips, uh, than the human fingertip, which is about 1,000 to 2,000. So we have about 100 uh, tactile sensors uh, over about a one centimeter square area uh, uh, mounted on, on a, a prosthetic uh, hand or finger. Uh, and we can actually use it to detect sandpaper of uh, and also many different materials right and here's a here's actually the sandpaper um, surface optical uh, microscope surface and we can also map the z heights of such uh, structures using this the optical microscope uh, that we have and as you press these the sensor on the surface you get an indentation map and these are basically uh, frames that changes as to press on the surface. Now, this is quite different from how humans typically perceive texture. Humans rely on uh, motion, uh, sliding motion across surfaces to get the texture. Uh, and in this case, because we are not, um, you know, because we, we actually have, uh, we can use a frame-based approach uh, without sliding because of our material is very soft and sensitive. Uh, we're actually able to get a one touch texture recognition, right? I think this will be different from most uh, sliding type of uh, texture perception uh, that is quite popular in uh, literature. And so we, we sort of uh, use different textures on textile, sandpaper, uh, cotton, glass, uh, glove, and different kinds of fabric. And you can see that the low hysteresis sensor actually pretty gives very uh, good results in terms of accuracy, right? Uh, in this case, Compared to the high hysteresis sensor, again, you know, we get a very good uh, accuracy, right? 94% uh, versus 60, 70%. Uh, importantly, the deviation is also quite low. Uh, and, and so you can see the confusion matrix uh, is not as 
uh, a nice uh, in the diagonal for high hysteresis sensor. And this is kind of probably you can use certain machine learning algorithms to um, to get better results, but we kind of use a very standard, uh, simple algorithm. And, and we, the point here I want to make is that materials actually can help machine learning uh, perform better without uh, using more sophisticated algorithms uh, in, in the literature. So I have about, I'm coming to the last part of my talk, uh, which is about the transmission of information, which I talked about earlier, right? So uh, Johan, actually Johansson, um, you know, uh, and his uh, colleagues and his team did very nice studies, you know, using micro neurography and in Telluride, uh, one of the uh, uh, postdocs that uh, joined my group actually attended Telluride. He, he was from uh, Nutish group uh, earlier. And so he, he was also very interested in uh, neuromorphic uh, systems and pushing the uh, performance limits. Uh, anyway, he had, I think he attended Telluride. He had the video that Nitish showed uh, where there was a micro neurography experiment. I think it was, was probably three or four years ago now. Uh, basically, the skin encodes uh, information in in a, in a form of spikes, right? I think many of you are very familiar with this already, so I won't uh, belabor this. Um, at the same time, there's also been very nice neuromorphic work on computation. Uh, Intel, uh, Loihi, for example, and we are starting to see more and more different kinds of neuromorphic uh, circuits and processes coming online, which is very exciting. It's a nice uh, review in nature if you'd like to find out more about it. Um, and I think the team gave a very nice uh, introduction to the whole field right, uh, uh, early on as well. So in terms of sensing, especially skin-like sensing, uh, we started uh, with synchronous systems uh, and started to move towards event-driven systems. Uh, and, and also uh, Kiara also had very nice uh, work on sort of more asynchronous like uh, protocols uh, that had sort of a, a nice architecture where you're able to transmit quite compressed information quite high in high speed across uh, the different uh, number of sensors. And this was, I think, I believe used in the iCup uh, robot uh, quite well. Uh, and so we were looking at ways to develop a fully distributed architecture where each, each sensor is able to send an information, a very simple information, and then through the population response, be able to understand the contact properties. And so uh, we were looking at more towards a fully asynchronous system, and we looked at uh, different ones, uh, and the AER uh, representation uh, seems to work quite well, and so we kind of adopted that. Uh, and our, and, and um, Basically, we also looked at nervous systems and how they work. And we realized that the nervous system, if we were to mimic it, uh, would be challenging from a system's point of view because you would need a lot of wires wiring up each of these individual sensors. And so we came up with a uh, technique uh, which we call asynchronous coded electronic skins or ACES, uh, where the information can be transmitted over a single wire uh, and then decoded by the CPU or, or some form of computing um, chip. It can be an ASIC or it can be uh, programmed MC, uh, FPGA or MCU where you can then deconvolute the signals, right? And so how do we program this? Uh, how do we combine address event representation with the ability to have fully asynchronous behavior without sort of, uh, without a central clock? If we didn't want a central clock, you know, we could, right? Uh, in, in this case. And so we looked at the action potentials and uh, neurons fire with you know about one millisecond kind of uh, voltage signal, um, but with electronics uh, we are not limited by ionic currents and their speed, so we can go much faster. So we can program, for example, an MCU or just or, or a digital uh, chip that they generate certain spike uh, patterns, right? And here I show five different spike patterns uh, for each of our sensors we call receptors, and so you can see that these uh, patterns are distinct and these are transmitted uh, in an asynchronous fashion uh, across uh, using a uh, circuit technique, uh, just to basically summing up the signal, right? Using a summing amplifier, you can actually sum up the signal in time. Uh, and the back end, uh, we can then decode the signal because we know the spike patterns, right? And it's a simple deconvolute, uh, fairly simple uh, deconvolution algorithm actually. And it actually is very low power uh, very easy to implement. Uh, we've implemented a full system 
uh, from the front end uh, sensing all the way to the decoding uh, using FPGA, but we're moving to ASICs uh, currently. And um, through such demonstrations uh, of our system, we can get very high, uh, I would say, uh, response speed, right? It's always very tricky when compared to uh, humans, but generally you can, we kind of peg it to the action potential speed, which is about a millisecond. So we just roughly a, a kilohertz. Of course, these massively parallel. Uh, but in this case, for us, we can transmit all the information over a single wire and we are able to get resolutions between each address or each receptors of about 60 nanoseconds uh, just because they're fully asynchronous. And uh, there's also a lack, uh, we also do not need any uh, collision detection algorithms uh, because it's simply summing up analog, analog signals. Uh, so we can implement for all kinds of sensors, temperature sensors, and we can implement different encoding schemes. For example, the slow adapting uh, receptor schemes or the fast adapting receptor schemes that you might be familiar with. And so here I show uh, two kinds of encoding, right? The slow adapting is uh, basically uh, frequency based. So uh, the skin, for example, has uh, Meissner's uh, propulsors that generate frequency outputs. So the higher the frequency, the higher the force. And so, so here we, we can encode it that way, or we can also encode it in a fast adapting mode, which is very useful for fast transient events, contact events, right? And we can actually pick up the uh, needle prick the prick of needle uh, from a diabetes uh, type of needle is uh, very fast. You just press a button, it, it's a spring loader mechanism. You click and, and you can actually see that uh, spike coming out, right? And what's also quite interesting is that we can encode for negative events or, or decrease in force, which the skin actually, at least to my knowledge, doesn't do, right? So we can generate positive uh, spikes or negative spikes that tells you whether the force is increasing or decreasing. And so this gives you, this can, you know, it's actually something that may give, maybe give you more information about your contact mechanics. Um, and you may ask the question, well, you know, this is quite interesting, but what if all these signatures overlap at the same time, right? And so we did uh, sort of some simulations where it's hard to simulate, uh, it's hard to make very large arrays uh, where we started. So we use simulations and we simulated to about thousand a simultaneous receptor transmission. Uh, and we see that the false positive rates uh, per signature or the probability of getting a false positive or, or a misdetection uh, is reasonably low. Uh, and, and actually, uh, you know, in, in order of uh, one over a million, right? So, so it's not too bad. And we do see that uh, in, in, in the real world, usually these... Um, transmission won't happen simultaneously, right? And so actually we should, we actually see much better performance in the real world because they don't typically overlap, right? Just because the way uh, contact is made, right? The mechanics of the whole system usually do not give you 100% activation at the same time of all your answers. And so we can get sort of spike pattern uh, or spatial temporal patterns. And these patterns might be useful uh, for detecting texture. And um, as I shown earlier, or also uh, curvature, right? So here's just a view. I don't know because Zoom might be a bit slow. Uh, you might not be able to see, but uh, if you don't have a high-speed sensor, you know, you see a flash if you contact the surface, but with a high-speed recording uh, where each right, uh, white dots represent a positive signal and the black dot represents a negative uh, signal or change in the force, you know, you get this kind of spatial temporal patterns. And so, um, the system is also more robust or can be made more robust. Uh, here's a simple uh, matrix type of uh, array with a, a pressure sensitive uh, resistor material. Uh, if you cut these uh, such, such arrays, uh, what happens is your, your sensors uh, stop working because the connection is destroyed. But if you have a distributed uh, system where each sensor is transmitting a, its own address, right? Uh, and they're all wired up in with multiple paths. So even if you cut certain wires, uh, you're still able to power the entire array and you're still able to have that kind of uh, signal transmission right, at the same, same time, uh, even though the array can be badly damaged. As long as you have one, one uh, connection to your CPU, uh, you'll actually work. So the high speed can allow us to get sort of good accuracy in terms of shape and curvature 
uh, even if it's the objects with the same shape, uh, we can actually tell whether it's hard or soft uh, as, uh, as well with very good accuracy. And importantly, the time response is fast. This could be useful for robotics or prosthetics uh, that may need such high speed to make decisions right, about what to do. Uh, and I think Harold uh, presented earlier on, so, so we started working with uh, machine learning scientists, uh, neomorphic algorithms. And so I think he presented uh, uh, the work where we combine vision, neomorphic vision with neomorphic touch uh, using our sense, sensing architectures. Uh, and so in terms of data set, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually um, uh, happy that uh, to share that, you know, this data set is widely available uh, ever since we published in on archive. So uh, do check out the paper uh, and, uh, and download the data set if you're interested. Uh, and basically we made a uh, MNIST-like data set for touch uh, where actually we got, you know, I, I think all my lab members write, uh, write uh, handwritten digits uh, so we have different individuals and different writing styles and speeds. And so this data set you know, has a fairly large number of images uh, and all having the neomorphic uh, spatial temporal patterns. Uh, and so here's an example, right? Uh, from zero to two seconds, you probably finished writing the letter eight and you can see the spike patterns, right? And you can sort of use machine learning uh, algorithms that you're learning, hopefully from Telluride uh, to get better uh, classification accuracy. So we did very simple ones, uh, very non-optimized ones, and we got roughly 80% 80, um, 80 uh, type of accuracy. Uh, and I think we also used the Loihi and Slayer, uh, and we got about 80 something percent, right? So if you're interested, you know, hopefully you can push that to even higher uh, accuracies, right? 95 or higher. Um, and I'd like to end off with uh, saying that I think the field of uh, you know, um, tactile skin is really uh, exciting. And in material science, we can even make te technologies where sensor materials can repair, self-repair. Uh, we published several kinds of materials about this already. Uh, and so, so here's an example where you can see a scar early on that completely disappeared. Right? So this material is transparent uh, and might be useful in uh, touchscreen applications. And so we also have a new work in uh, recently published where we can sense proximity uh, as well as pressure. And all these uh, basically presents the analog change, but then all these changes can be detected and encoded neuromorphically using our ACES architecture or other architectures that uh, you design uh, for neuromorphic uh, algorithms. So I think it's really exciting and uh, happy to discuss if you have any interest in collaborating. So I'd like to acknowledge my group uh, and, and many of the uh, people who have uh, worked on the various projects of collaborators and also, of course, the funding agencies. And the nice thing about, I think, working in a, a research group uh, is that the average age of the group, uh, you know, is lower uh, and, they, and, and they kind of uh, keep my uh, mind young, uh, even though I'm, uh, you know, certainly cannot say I'm, I, I can think like a teenager or my 20s anymore. But I think it's really exciting working with young people and also uh, appreciate the time uh, and your attention. So I'd like to uh, thank you. Uh, and again, I, I run the census to AI Labs. Feel free to reach out to me uh, on, on my email or uh, Twitter account. Uh, and this uh, QR code is a LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. It was really, really interesting. And you touched many different aspects of the tactile sensing, really ranging from the materials uh, to, to computation. And I think it's uh, really uh, a lot of work that you have done uh, and is really promising. So I don't know if um, there are questions we are, we are not many. So if you want just to unmute and, uh, and ask questions, we can know make it a bit more um interactive i will stop recording so you you don't you're not shy 